I'm so excited because the first book by Darkness Prevails and Carmen Carrion is available for pre-order right now. It's the Freaky Folklore Compendium, filled with the history and lore of the most terrifying folklore monsters across the globe, alongside some cool but creepy illustrations. Releases July 16th. Pre-order now at eeriecast.com freak or on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and your favorite bookstore. Get ready to delve into the realm of the unexplained as we explore allegedly true stories of paranormal encounters and mysterious creatures that will send shivers down your spine. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, prepare to be captivated by these chilling accounts. If you have a creepy story of the unexplained, I want to narrate it on this show. Send it to me at darkstories.org. I recommend listening to Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Links are in the description, or just go to eeriecast.com. Now, let's begin. Bridge Water Triangle in Massachusetts Story From Dan the Man now it is understandable to dismiss all the stories about the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts as nothing more than urban legend, tall tales, or a good yarn we New Englanders spin for tourists. But man, the Bridgewater Triangle does not disappoint. By far, the most frightening experience I have ever had in the Triangle occurred in the late 80s. At the time, I resided in a town which sits at the northern tip of the Triangle. It all started in the summer of 1988. I was 19 years old and finally striking out on my own. I moved into the Rain Tree Village apartment complex in the town of Abington. There is nothing remarkable about Abington. It is a sleepy blue-collar town 21 miles south of Boston. At least, that is how I found it for a while. The complex itself was not much to look at, just a decaying relic of the 1960s. What got my attention was the wooded area that bordered the complex on three sides. At night, the few remaining security lights that still functioned struggled to illuminate the black void of the woods. Little did I know that in the coming days, weeks, and months, I would encounter something I can still not, to this day, reconcile with in my mind. The first time I encountered the little SOBs, I found myself floating out of my first floor window, down the back of my complex, towards the woods. I could not figure out why. After a second or two, I looked up and completely freaked out. My heart started racing. I was in full flight or fight mode. I could not move, and I could not believe what I was seeing. I found myself surrounded by diminutive, pale white creatures with spindly little arms and legs. It was like a slow motion nightmare. When we finally made it to the woods and passed into the black void effortlessly, I was struggling. I wanted to run, but I was stuck like a fly in a web. I wanted to lash out at the little bastards. Then everything went black. The next thing I know, it's morning and I am in my bed. For the rest of the summer, I would have periodic late-night encounters with these creatures. The visits were random and followed no logical pattern. The memories of these encounters come to me in flashes like a demented kaleidoscope of terror. My encounters with these entities ended when I moved back to Boston that winter. Over 30 years later, I still have no explanation for what happened that summer of 1988. I move. It moves. We all move. From noon, three. When I turned 18, I wanted to leave my dad's and go live with my mom. My mom had my little brother, Tin, and my little sister, four, living with her as well. I was finishing my last bit of high school left, about three months, when I had moved. She was in a two-story duplex, with the second story being the master bedroom with a bathroom and a closet. The downstairs was a big loop. You could walk in, turn left into the living room, turn right into a hallway that had the stairs up, two bedrooms and a bathroom at the end of the hallway, turn right at the end of the hallway, 
and there was a short hallway that had an alcove for the washer and dryer. Then it went straight into the kitchen. Turn right again, and you would end where you began. The first night I stayed there, I had an air mattress, a TV, and my clothes. I laid on the mattress watching some show that I ended up falling asleep to. I was asleep for about an hour or two before I woke up for some reason. I think it was because of the TV still being on, and I slowly opened my eyes. As I did so, I saw what looked to be a massive spider, about the size of my face, crawl up the wall less than a foot away from me. I jumped up and tried to see if I could locate it. Now, I'm not afraid of spiders in the slightest. I love most insects, but spiders the most. I do, however, have a problem with waking up to a monster of one in front of my face. But when I got up to look, I found nothing. As there was nothing in the room for it to hide behind, I could not find it. I turned on the light and searched for 20 or so minutes. I wanted to take it outside so I wouldn't wake up to a heart attack again. I just could not find it, so I turned out the lights and went back to bed. When I got up in the morning, I asked her about spiders in the house. She said she thought she saw a massive one the first night, that she stayed there, but never saw it again. I didn't tell her what I saw that night, since I know how my mom is about bugs. My mom is into paranormal investigating. She likes to go around to cemeteries and record voice and video. Well, one day, I suggested doing it here and seeing if she catches anything. She left her voice recorder on overnight, and we reviewed it the following night. My little sister stayed in my mom's room with her at the time. My mom caught what sounded like a little girl trying to get my little sister out of bed to play with her. My sister is a stubborn one, so when she's tired, she's tired. After my mom caught this, she started recording it a lot more. She's caught footsteps, knocking, as well as more voices. She's caught the little girl trying to get my sister to play with her a few more times, but she's caught a lot more. She kept it in her bedroom when it was recording at night. She has caught a woman talking and trying to get her attention a few times, as well as an older man. At my mom's, my problems with the paranormal had followed me. Footsteps, knocking, obviously voices, as well as the stove turning on. My mom or I would constantly find melted utensils, and as she had witnessed this when she stayed with me, she knew it wasn't my brother or I. She decided after dealing with this for a while, she would set up a camera in the kitchen. A few days go by and nothing. My mom gave up and put it away for about a week before getting it out again. That time it got something. It was about 1.30 in the morning when it got cabinets and drawers opening and closing. It only did it a few times before it stopped. But about 30 minutes later, my brother walks into the kitchen trying to sneak a midnight suite. As he was in the fridge in the far back corner, you could see it start to darken and a form take shape. Its head almost touched the ceiling and my brother never saw it. He returned to his room defeated from his failure to find sweets. The next day, we showed it to him and he was horrified. I ended up working nights at the gas station there, so I would get home about 1, 1.30 at night. Part of my routine when I got home was to sit there on my phone for 30 minutes, waiting to see if he would get up and try to sneak some sweets. I caught him a few times, but most of the times that I heard things opening in the kitchen, there was no one there. We never caught the stove on video while it was in the kitchen. My brother wanted to record his room while he was sleeping. He would soon regret this. He caught what looked to be a child's hand move through the wall and touch his face. There were a few shadows in the doorway that he caught, as well as light anomalies. The last one he recorded was what made him regret trying. This boy does not move in his sleep. Once he falls asleep in a position, he stays in that position until he wakes up. While he is sleeping, you can see a mass in his bed, blanket and all, about two feet up towards the foot of his bed. He was so scared he was afraid to go into his room for a week. After we started recording, we started seeing things more. Figures moving through the halls and kitchen, even up the stairs. 
Most are the size of children, and we confuse them with my little sister. We also see the man and woman walking around. The man has old military boots, but that's all I've been able to see in detail. He is the main one I see, and my mom sees the kids. We only see the woman when we were alone together. I have since moved out of my mother's house. She continues to have her experiences to this day, but it seems to have lessened for her once I had moved. Be careful hiking in the Bighorn Mountains, from Coulter Morgan. The Bighorn Mountains are a stretch of jagged peaks near Buffalo and Sheridan, Wyoming. I have lived in Buffalo for four years and work as a hunting guide for antelope, but in this particular story, I was on a hike, not hunting. Before I moved out here, I lived in Georgia. I have always enjoyed the outdoors and wanted to be a guide, so that's what I did. Moving a grueling 25-hour drive away is not easy, to say the least, especially right out of high school. The story I am about to tell takes place the summer after my senior year. A girl that I was really close to, Alyssa, decided she wanted to come and visit me, and we could spend a week together hiking. Alyssa and I met in high school and never dated, but bonded as we were both avid outdoors people. She was one of the few people who I really kept in touch with from high school. Anyway, she arrived at the Sheridan, Wyoming airport on July 2nd, where I picked her up. And we began the drive to my cabin, where we would prepare for our camping trip ahead. The particular mountain we were going to hike was called Cloud Peak. At a staggering 13,000 foot elevation, that's a lot. After we got our stuff ready, tents, guns for protection, fishing equipment, etc. We got in bed and watched some Netflix before we fell asleep. We woke up at 5.30 and drove to the trailhead. The first three days of our trip went regular, hiking, fishing, warming up by the fire, and more hiking. But on day number four, right around noon, all hell broke loose. We were walking down a stream talking and fishing for trout, when all of a sudden, a monstrous boulder was thrown right in front of us. We looked up to see something I can only describe as a coyote man staring at us. Out of instinct, I pulled my 44 Colt out and fired off a shot. I could tell it was a hit. This creature toppled over and let out a blood-curdling scream before running away. Let's just say we called that trip short and took a long hike back down the hill. Three years later, Alyssa is my fiance, and we live together in the Bighorn Mountains where we both are licensed hunting guides. It's safe to say we will never go to Cloud Peak Trail again. The Woman in the Bathroom Mirror from Spooky Guy 556 these few encounters happened to me a number of years ago, while I was still living in my parents' house. I was in high school at the time, maybe 17 or 18 years old. A few years prior to this, we had moved, staying in the same small city but upgrading to a larger house. My family and I moved around a lot, so I was used to it, but we never experienced anything paranormal or odd in any of the houses we lived in. So. When things started happening in our new house, it was a weird combination of being kind of excited and terrified at the same time. The home we were moving into was bigger than anything I was used to, and I was excited to finally have my own room. I'm the oldest sibling and have shared a room my whole life up until this point. During our first visit to the house, my parents let me pick out the room I wanted first. I walked through the house carefully inspecting all the bedrooms. The home still had several pieces of furniture in it, and I asked my parents if the owners had left them behind. There were lots of glass display cases and shelves, at least two in every single bedroom and sitting area. My parents pulled me into another room and whispered, we don't want to tell the younger kids, but the woman who had lived here before collected dolls and had them displayed in every room. 
I can't imagine how many dolls this woman had in order to be able to fill the shelves in all six bedrooms and three main seating areas. It spooked me a little, but they were gone now, so I quickly pushed it to the back of my mind. My parents then said, also that lady died in this house, so we're waiting to hear back from her kids if they want these shelves or not. This again made me slightly uneasy, but I was too excited about the new house to worry about it then. I settled on a large basement room down the hall for my two younger brothers. After we got everything moved in and settled down, my parents thought this was the perfect opportunity to get me and my three younger siblings a dog. One day, they surprised us, walking through the door with a barely one-year-old golden labradoodle named Charlie. I love that dog, and he is still around today as I write this. He warmed up to our family and quickly became very protective. Anytime we would wrestle or play fight, he would lunge and grip onto clothes or whatever toy sword or pillow we were fighting with and tear it out of our hands or pull us away, barking and growling ferociously. He has never hurt or bitten me or anyone in my family. He's a very gentle dog, but something about his previous owners made him very defensive to abuse and violence. After a few months, he took more of a liking to me than my other family members. Every single night, he would sleep at the foot of my bed, and when he wasn't there, I would be woken up at an ungodly hour of the night to him scratching at my door, begging to be let in. One of the first encounters was a few years after we had moved in. I had gotten in bed and was listening to music before going to sleep. Charlie wasn't in my room, but I figured he was just in the backyard or something and would scratch on my door soon enough. I would lift my headphones off periodically to make sure he wasn't there. As I lay in my room in the pitch darkness, I suddenly felt my bed move. I took my headphones off and sat up, listening intently. My bed moved again, and I heard a heavy scratching noise, but not the normal scratch at the door from Charlie. This scratching was coming from inside my room. I fumbled on my nightstand for the knife I kept next to my bed and gripped it tightly once I recognized the feel of it in my hand. The scratching continued, getting more and more aggressive until it suddenly stopped and the room was silent. It was then that Charlie jumped up on my bed and he's lucky I didn't stab him. He had somehow managed to squeeze himself under my bed and the scratching noise had been him trying furiously to escape with the weight of me on top of him. Poor thing, I had no idea he was under there. He had never done that before, but I brushed it off, reaching down to pet him as he settled into his normal spot on my bed. I put my headphones back on, and as my heart rate slowed back down, I fell asleep. A few hours later, I was woken up by movement on my bed again. I sleepily woke up and realized I still had my headphones on. Music was no longer playing, but they were still covering my ears, blocking out any noise. I reached over to unplug them from my phone and check the time, the screen blinding me as I turned it on. It was around 3.15 a.m., the witching hour. I had experienced things at this time before. I lifted my headphones off my ears, which were sore from having them on almost all night, and was met with the sounds of growling. I angled my phone screen towards Charlie and noticed he was standing. That's what had woken me up. Charlie getting up. Charlie, I whispered. He didn't respond to me. He was staring at my bedroom door, still growling. I sat up and listened quietly to see if maybe he had just heard someone going to the bathroom, but I heard nothing and didn't see the hallway light under my door, indicating my brothers were awake. Charlie, I whispered again, reaching forward and resting my hand on his back. He whipped his head around, startled, as if he hadn't heard me calling or noticed I was awake. What is it? My hand still resting on his back as I turned on and shone my phone flashlight around the room. There was no one there, as expected, and shortly after, he lied back down like nothing had happened. I lied back down as well and listened to the silence of the house, trying to rationalize what he had been growling at. After another 40 minutes or so of complete silence and darkness, 
I finally fell back asleep. The next few months passed without anything weird happening, and I brushed off that night as Charlie just tweaking over nothing. The next incident happened shortly after. It was a weekend, and my whole family was home and had gone to bed. I didn't have work the next day and was obsessed with a new video game I had bought. I was on the couch in our downstairs living room, which sits directly below our entry room upstairs, just inside the front door, and looks out over the front yard. In this downstairs living room, the heating vents are in the ceiling, and you can hear the little adjustment flap rattle slightly if anyone closes the front door or is walking around upstairs in the entry room. I was sitting there playing video games around 3 a.m. when I heard that vent rattle. Charlie loves the entry room. He sits on the bench below the large window and looks out into the yard. Him jumping down off this bench also makes the ceiling vent rattle, so I figured that's what it was and didn't think anything of it. I continued playing and expected to hear Charlie head down the stairs soon to make his way to my room, as he usually does around this hour, but he never came. Another ten or so minutes passed, and I heard it again. I paused my game to listen and heard it several more times. Getting slightly spooked, I went back to my bedroom to grab the baseball bat I kept next to my bed and brought it out onto the couch with me. I listened again but didn't hear anything and went back to my video games. Another 20 minutes passed and the rattling vent started again. I paused my game again to listen, but this time the rattle was paired with what sounded like footsteps in the upstairs entry room. That's odd, I thought. Who's awake in the front room at this hour? Then, suddenly, the footsteps increased pace and sounded like they were running. I could hear it clearly and the vent was rattling like crazy. They then got quieter, but I could still hear them as if someone was running through a different part of our house. I decided to go investigate. Maybe Charlie was having a bad dream, or one of my parents was awake and needed help with something. I made my way to the stairs, bringing my bat with me. I reached the bottom of the stairs and flipped on the light. I could no longer hear the running footsteps, and the vent had stopped rattling. I looked up the stairwell into the darkness upstairs. There was no way one of my family members was running around up here in the dark and hadn't yet run into anything or fallen. I raised the bat and quietly made my way up the stairs. I reached the top and flipped on another light switch, illuminating the dining room. I poked my head around the banister into the dining room and kitchen behind it to see no one. I stopped then and listened for more footsteps and was met with silence. I walked away from the dining room towards the front door and entry room where I had heard the sounds. I flipped on the entry hallway light and could see the front door deadbolt was still locked. I rounded the corner and turned on the entry room lights, only to be met by the usual furniture. I wandered around upstairs for a minute, keeping my bat raised just in case when I saw the distant upstairs hallway light flip on. My mom and Charlie walked out into the dining room to see me wandering around with a baseball bat at 3.30 a.m. What the hell are you doing? My mom said as Charlie walked happily over to greet me. Were you just out here? I asked. No. She responded groggily. Did you have Charlie with you? I asked. Yeah, he was on our bed, she said. And the door was closed? I inquired. Yeah, but he got up and started whining when he heard you out here. I looked around some more. Why do you have a bat? My mom asked, seeming more awake now. I swear someone was up here. I responded. What? My mom asked. I was downstairs playing games and heard someone running around up here. The vents and lights were all rattling in the TV room and I could hear footsteps, I said. We then both walked through every room in the house making sure no one had broken in. The house was empty other than my family. Well, that's creepy. Maybe Mrs. Johnson isn't too happy with Dad's work, she joked. Johnson was the last name of the woman who had died there, and my mom was referring to my dad having torn apart the hole upstairs and remodeled the floor plan. Maybe she was visiting and didn't recognize her own house. I'm sure it's fine, just go to bed, she said. This gave me chills, 
and I was happy to see Charlie follow me downstairs instead of going back into my parents' bedroom. I went back to my room and went to bed without any other noises in the night. Not long after that, experience was the spookiest and final disturbance that I personally witnessed. I had been up late again the night before playing video games. I woke up the next morning around 11, 12. I had since graduated high school and my siblings were all at school by this time. Charlie was sitting by my bedroom door, whining, indicating he needed to be let out to use the bathroom. I got up and opened the door to let him out. I heard him walk down the hallway and exit through the dog door we had in the basement. I stepped out into the hallway and into the bathroom, which was directly outside my bedroom and to the left. Standing in the bathroom, you can see down the hallway through the reflection of the mirror into the downstairs living room where I had experienced the running footsteps months before. On the opposite end of the room from the stairway, there is a cold storage room under our front porch where we kept food and other household items. I entered the bathroom and looked at myself in the mirror, trying to gather the strength to start the day. I leaned forward towards the mirror and put in my contacts, blinking quickly to get them to settle onto my eye. This bathroom downstairs has one of those cabinets behind the mirror where the mirror was split into three sections and is hinged to be able to access the shelves behind it. I opened the left side of the mirror, temporarily changing the angle of the glass, blocking my view of the hallway. I grabbed my toothbrush and toothpaste from the cabinet and noticed the toothpaste tube was almost empty. I squeezed out what little remained in the tube onto my toothbrush and tossed the empty tube into the garbage. I closed the left side of the mirror and saw the outline of someone standing in the living room at the end of the hall near the stairway. I stuck my head out in the hallway and turned around, thinking I was imagining it or my contacts were playing tricks on me. Right as I turned around, I saw the figure walk across the living room out of sight towards the cold storage room. They were wearing jeans and a yellow shirt. I remember this detail very well. I didn't get a good look at who it was, but I just assumed it was my mother coming downstairs to grab something from the storage room. We kept the toothpaste in the storage room, and I called out to her sloppily with my toothbrush in my mouth. Hey mom, will you grab me some toothpaste while you're in there? No response. Dad? I asked questioningly, thinking it was him. Still no response. It was then I realized I hadn't heard anyone go up or down the stairs and also hadn't heard the cold storage room open yet. I stopped brushing my teeth and listened for anyone. I was met with silence. I spit into the sink and set my toothbrush down, walking hesitantly into the dark living room, illuminated only by the light from the bathroom. No one was there. I turned the light on and walked behind the couch to see if someone was pranking me. There was no one there either. I checked the storage room and two closets in the room as well, and found all to be empty. I walked upstairs and called out for Charlie. I didn't hear his paws on the tile or the jingle of his collar, so I assumed he was still outside. Hello, I shouted and got no response. I walked over to the garage and opened it. My parents' car was gone, which means they weren't even home. So who the hell had I just seen in the basement wearing yellow? It was a bit odd and also the reason I never did anything to counteract these events, but I wasn't scared by this. I felt strangely at peace, and my mom's words came to mind. Maybe it's just old Mrs. Johnson. I didn't have any other explanation for this and figured honestly my mom was probably right. I called her then to verify she wasn't home, and she said she was. My dad had taken the car, and she was gardening in the backyard. I walked outside to see her kneeled over our garden and Charlie rolling in the grass near her. The very first thing I noticed is she was wearing light tan pants and a gray t-shirt, a completely different outfit from who I had just seen inside the house. Were you just inside? I asked as I approached. She turned around, covered in sweat and dirt. No, why? She asked. I swear I just saw someone in the basement wearing a yellow shirt and I thought it was you so I asked a question and when I went and checked, no one was there. She took her gloves off and looked up at me. 
Yeah, probably just Mrs. Johnson, confirming to me that she and I were the only ones home. After that occurrence, my parents started talking to Mrs. Johnson like she was there. It sounds stupid, but every time my dad would tear down a wall or pull up old tile to remodel, my mom would say aloud, I'm sorry, Mrs. Johnson. You have a beautiful, beautiful home. We're just changing a few things, don't worry. Oddly enough, I never had another experience after we started doing that, and no one in my family has either. I've moved out since then, but sometimes when I visit, I'm sure to say hello to Mrs. Johnson and let her know we love her house. I'm glad I've had this experience, and it just goes to show not all spirits are evil. It seems like sometimes they just stay behind a while to make sure the things they loved in life are well cared for. The Morning I'll Never Forget From Truthfinder 16 This happened a while ago when I was young. For some context, my parents were going through a bad fight, so my mother took me and my siblings to my grandma's house in rural Missouri. I was laying in the guest bedroom during the first experience. I had a pallet on the floor, and the door was facing the kitchen. A quick side note about the property. It was built a long time ago, and we've even found what seemed like old cannonballs from the Civil War in the ground around the property. It was around two or three in the morning when I felt a weird, almost primal fear. I looked towards the doorway, where I saw a tall, dark, and skinny figure. It was standing there, staring into my room. I laid there, unable to move, my eyes transfixed. It stood there, staring at me, until my grandma's dog, Lucky, came out of her room. It turned and sort of ran through the kitchen. I heard the back door slam shut. I was in shock. What seemed like a sort of apparition was able to move and slam a door. I knew then and there it was no apparition. Somehow, some way, this thing got into the house, was standing in my doorway, and staring at me for God knows how long. That was only the first time I encountered it. The second time, I was up in the attic, going through some old stuff, when I heard a weird noise on the window. Now, this is a two-story house when you count the attic, so it was pretty high off the ground. I walked over and checked the window. There was a small crack where something had hit it, I looked down and into the tree line, and the thing was standing there, its eyes glaring at me. I stumbled back, then ran down the stairs to the kitchen. I looked into the tree line, but it was gone. I knew it was taunting me. Nobody would believe me, except for my grandmother. She told me how she felt like something was out there, an evil presence. The animals were skittish during the early morning hours and the evening as if they knew something was out there. My final encounter was while I was outside with my little cousins. We were playing flashlight tag during the late evening hours. I thought with the adults out there, nothing would happen. I was gravely wrong. I was running from my cousin and hid in the tree line. I was there for a while before I smelled a disgusting, rotten smell. I felt as if something was behind me and that's when I felt hot breath on my neck. I froze. There was a deep, guttural growl. I slowly turned around, and that was my first real look at it. Its mouth had no lips. They seemed to be peeling and rotting. Its eyes were sunken and yellow, and its nose was scabbed. It was almost smiling at me. It whispered in a sort of menacing version of my grandmother's voice. This is no place for a child. I could barely breathe. I turned and ran, barely able to see where I was going. My eyes were filling with tears. I stumbled into the light of the bonfire and collapsed. I couldn't speak. My grandmother ran over and grabbed me. She told my uncles to round up my cousins and siblings, and we went inside. Nobody was allowed outside for the rest of the night. I didn't tell them what I saw but she knew. I never went outside at night after that. It spoke to me. It snuck up on me so silently. It knew what it was doing. I feel like it wanted to instill fear in me, as if it enjoyed causing terror. 
I'm older now, and I still won't go into the woods of Missouri without a weapon and a group of friends with me. Thanks for reading this. I didn't know where else to tell my story. Whatever is out there, it's nothing good. Paranormal Happenings From page H92 I live in a small town in Alaska, and I am a 31-year-old female. The things that I am about to tell you happened when I was growing up in my parents' house in the middle of the woods. I do not remember specific dates, but the first one happened when I was about 14. My dad was at work in the oil field, so it was just my mom, me, and my three younger brothers at home. It was around 9.30 p.m. in the middle of the winter. My mom was in her bedroom on the phone with my dad at work, while my younger brothers and I were downstairs in the basement, watching a movie. Loud and consistent banging started happening, and my mom yelled at us kids, Knock it off and be quiet! We at first ignored her because we did not realize that she was talking to us, as we thought she was the one banging. After a while, we realized that the banging was not her, as it was coming from outside. We lived in a small neighborhood with one house across the street from us and one house next to ours that we could not see through the trees. There were also two neighbors behind us, but there was a huge stretch of woods that you had to walk at least 15 minutes through to reach their houses, and you still could not see them through the trees. My brothers and I turned off our movie and went upstairs to look through the windows in the living room. Our house was a two-story house, with the basement being the second story. Our parents' room was in one corner of the house, and there was a small hallway separating their bedroom from the two bedrooms on the other side of the house, which also included our small kitchen and dining room. The kitchen and dining room were open, and you could see from the kitchen into the living room. Our kitchen had two back doors that opened to make one big door, and led out onto the back porch with a set of stairs that went down into the backyard. Each door had a huge window, that was basically the whole door with just a border of wood. We had a small window in our kitchen above the sink that looked into the backyard and three huge bay windows in the dining room that we did not have curtains on. In the living room, there were two big windows by the front door that looked out onto our front porch and the front yard, as well as a smaller window on the side of the living room that looked into the side of our yard and towards our neighbor's house right next to us. None of our windows had curtains that were closed. We kids were looking outside to see if we could find the source of the banging. It sounded like somebody had a hammer and was repeatedly bashing it against a piece of wood. Mind you, it was the middle of the night, winter, and completely pitch black outside. Our neighborhood was relatively quiet and nobody would be outside after dark working on anything. Our mom again yelled at us, knock it off and quit banging. All four of us yelled back simultaneously. It's not us. We aren't making any noise or banging on anything. Our mom came out of her room, still on the phone with our dad. She told him what was happening, and we could hear him say through the phone, just ignore it. It is probably just a neighbor. She told him that she was going to go out on the front porch. He told her that if she was going to do that, she should probably take the shotgun with her, just in case which is what she did. She went out on the porch and the banging stopped. She looked around for a minute longer and came back inside. As soon as she did, it started up again, but it continued to get louder and louder. Finally, she just told us to ignore it and go to bed. The second one happened a few months later. It was still winter and our dad was again back at work. We had been out earlier that day shopping and running errands. As it was Friday night, we got pizza from Pizza Hut and went home to eat it. Our mom was in the basement eating her dinner, she is a vegetarian, and watching a movie, while us kids were at the square wooden table in our dining room. One brother and I were on one side, and my two other brothers were on the other side. In our living room, there was a couch that faced the windows, so the back was facing the dining room, there were two small bookshelves behind the couch, also facing the dining room. We were talking, laughing, and enjoying our dinner when, out of nowhere, a small kitchen towel flew from the middle of the living room, over the back of the couch, over the bookshelves, 
and landed on the other side of the dining room table by the back doors. We all froze and started to accuse each other of throwing the towel, but all of us had our hands on the table, and there was absolutely no way that any of us would have been able to throw the towel from the middle of the living room. Then we all started talking over each other and decided that it must have been our mom playing a joke on us. I called out, Mom, what are you doing? She yelled back, I am watching my movie. What do you need? To which I replied, Nothing. I turned and looked at my brothers, who were all looking back at me with the same horrified look that I knew was on my face. My youngest brother asked if we should tell our mom what happened, but all three of us older kids said no, that she would not believe us and would think we were making it up. Another encounter happened when I was 16. I was allowed to have one friend from school come over and stay the night. Our basement was a daylight basement, which means that half of the basement is underground, so my bedroom window was level with the ground outside. My birthday is in late October, so it is the middle of winter. There were a few plants outside my bedroom window, but as it was winter, they were basically the bare bones of the plants. In my bedroom, the head of my bed was against the wall, and it faced the door to my room. Next to my bed was a small nightstand, which held my pink lamp. On the other side of the bed, there was a small desk against the wall underneath my window, which had heavy curtains on it that you had to pull a string, and they would fold upwards. I was on my bed, and my friend was on the floor at the end of my bed, with her head towards the window. We were talking and giggling, as high school girls at a sleepover tend to do. It was around midnight, and we were having a conversation when, clear as day, three hard and sharp raps rang at my bedroom window. Both of us froze and asked the other if we had heard that. We confirmed that we had both heard it and proceeded to try to get the other to look out the window and see what it was. Of course, we both refused to get up, so I ended up quickly turning out the lamp and tried to go to sleep. The next morning at breakfast, my mom was at the stove making oatmeal. I told her what had happened the night before. She asked if we had looked out the window, to which I replied, No. She turned to me and said, It was probably a good thing that you did not look. I am glad that you didn't look. It may have been something coming to try and take you away. My mom believed, as I believe in God, and that the spirit world does exist. We finished with breakfast and my friend went downstairs to pack up her stuff. I was still at the table, and my mom was still at the stove facing away from me, in a voice that sounded like hers, but didn't quite sound like her, she said. Too bad that you didn't look. Now you will forever wonder what would have happened if you had looked. These words made me shiver and confused me, as minutes before, she had just told me that it was a good thing that I had not looked and that she was glad that I hadn't. I asked her what she said, acting as if I hadn't heard her, and she said that she did not say anything. This still terrifies me today, but whoever had pretended to be my mom saying that last thing to me that morning was right. To this day, I still wonder what would have happened if I had looked. Even now, years later, that thought still terrifies me. Throughout my life, I have had many paranormal things happen to me. Two weeks before my 18th birthday, I left Alaska and went to visit family in Mississippi. I had two sets of aunts and uncles and a set of grandparents that I would switch between staying with during the four months that I was there. This happened while I was staying at my aunt and uncle's house in Petal. My aunt and uncle had gone out to the bar, so it was me, my 20-year-old female cousin, my 16-year-old sister, and my biological mom, who lived in Arizona but had come to visit for a couple of weeks around Thanksgiving, alone at the house. We all stayed up in the living room watching a scary movie. I cannot remember which one now. It was around 1 a.m., and everybody else had fallen asleep in the living room, so I decided to go down the hallway to my cousin's bedroom and change into my pajamas. The house was an older, single-level house, 
and all of the doors were made of extremely heavy wood. The carpets were rather thick, so in order to shut the doors, you had to push rather hard as the doors would get stuck on the carpet. I went into the bedroom and closed the door three quarters of the way so that I could use the light from the hallway to see what I was doing. I grabbed my pajamas and went behind the door to change, just in case somebody happened to wake up and come down the hallway. I had just put my pajamas down and bent down to start to take off my shorts when the door behind me slammed shut. I jumped up, yanked the door open, and went to run down the hallway. I had barely made it down the hallway when the door slammed shut behind me again. I spent the rest of the night too terrified to sleep. Another time while I was in Mississippi, I was still at the same house in Petal. This time it was just me, my cousin, and my younger sister there, while all of the adults had gone out to Bourbon Street. My cousin had her digital camera, and we were taking a bunch of pictures sitting in the living room. At one point, we stopped taking pictures and started to look at the ones we had already taken. In every single picture, there were orbs of varying sizes, from the size of a marble to the size of a golf ball all over the place. We cleaned the camera lenses, took more pictures, looked at them, and the orbs were still in the pictures. It was dark outside, but we decided to take some pictures outside. Some we took in the middle of the road, some we took in the yard away from the house, and some we took right in front of the door to the house. The pictures that we took in the middle of the road and in the yard away from the house were empty, but the pictures that we took right by the house still had orbs in them, just not as many as there were in the pictures that we took inside the house. This last story was not experienced by me, but rather by my uncle's best friend, years before I had come to visit. My uncle and his best friend at the time ran a repo business, and my uncle's friend went over to my uncle's house to get him up for work. My uncle's friend rang the doorbell and knocked on the door with no answer, so he went to the window of the spare bedroom, as my uncle and aunt had been fighting, and my uncle was sleeping in the spare bedroom. My uncle's friend knocked on the bedroom window, and he could see through the spaces in the blinds the bunk bed that was in that room. He saw a dark shape jump down from the top bunk, come to the window, and stick two fingers between two blinds and look out. My uncle's friend went to the front door and waited for my uncle to come to the door and let him in. He stood there for five minutes, and nobody came. Getting angry, he started pounding on the door again. After about ten minutes, my uncle came to the door, hair disheveled and sleep in his bleary eyes. His friend said angrily, What took you so long to come to the door? You looked at me from the window of the spare room. It should not have taken you that long to come to the door. My uncle looked at him, confused, and said, I wasn't in that room. The wife and I made up a week ago. I was sleeping in the bedroom. Oconee Spirits From Swamp Fox my story takes place in the southern Appalachian mountains of Oconee County, South Carolina, in the summer of 2015. I grew up hiking and camping in this area, and continued that tradition in spare time for my day job as a geologist. As a hobby, I take pictures and write articles for an online outdoor publication. I often ask around for tips on interesting places and subjects for my articles. A friend introduced me to an elderly native gentleman who was known for his knowledge of the area and storytelling charm. The gentleman agreed to meet me for coffee one morning at a local diner. I found his company delightful and informative. We spoke for nearly two hours, and I took copious notes on the many stories he revealed. The tale I found most intriguing concerned a long-abandoned home place far off the beaten path up near the Georgia border. The property, I was told, included the ruins of an old house and a family cemetery. The story also involved a spooky ghost story, complete with family tragedy, cursed land, and such. As a man of science, I knew the story was superstitious hokum, added over the years to spice up the tale. In any case, the old gentleman gave me information I felt was sufficient 
to help me locate the place. Deciding to give the effort two days, I set off just before dawn on Saturday morning, accompanied by my big rescue mutt, Shan. The weather was glorious, with a filigree of sunlight to light my path, and just enough breeze to offer some relief from the South Carolina heat that reaches even the highest mountains this time of year. We made good time the first day on my pre-mapped search area. We had come up empty by the time the sun descended below the mountains. The natural beauty and unique energy of these ancient mountains made this trip worth it even if we never found the old home place. Sean's boundless energy compelled me to continue on longer than I usually would, but not wanting to wander in the darkness, I decided to start looking for a good place to set up camp for the evening. After a few minutes of searching, I was relieved to find a promising clearing in the heavily wooded forest. As we approached, I recognized the unmistakable outline of a decaying brick chimney. We had found the old home place. This is when things began to get weird. As I explored the area and searched for the old cemetery, I noticed that no trees grew in the clearing and there was only sparse, sickly-looking vegetation on the property surrounded by the deep green forest. That was strange, but I didn't give it much thought. Plants were not my specialty. Presently, I noticed that Sean was nowhere to be seen. He customarily stayed close by my side and never wandered out of sight. I retraced my steps and found him standing at the tree line just outside the clearing. He stood in a crouched, ready position, staring at the old ruins with laser focus as if sensing a threat. This behavior was far from his customary happy-go-lucky personality. He was a big boy, nearly 100 pounds, and he never showed fear in the woods. I had never seen him like this. Of course, I figured he smelled some strange wildlife and didn't know what to make of it. I went back to searching the area and soon found a few rusted metal crosses the family used to mark the graves. I took out my camera and began delightedly to take pictures of such a compelling sight. After about ten minutes of this, I stopped to take a drink from my canteen and noticed Sean had still not joined me. I walked back toward the tree line and saw that this time he was pacing nervously along the edge of the clearing, being careful to stay back among the trees. I called him, but he refused to come any closer and began bouncing on his feet as if to coax me to come to him. I took a quick look around the property again but saw nothing that might cause Sean to act this way. As it was beginning to get dark, I found a suitable place to camp at the edge of the woods, and this seemed to satisfy him. I gave him his dog food and a chew bone and cooked my meal over the little camp stove I carried. The night was cool and the woods were beautiful. As I began to relax and drift off, I decided to forego the tent and just camp outside. Sean lay down beside me and seemed perfectly content. I had taken some great pictures, had good material for my article, and was enjoying the mountains I loved so much. All this added up to a very successful trip. I soon fell into a deep and restful sleep with my buddy at my side. In the wee hours, I popped awake when I felt Sean jump up suddenly. His ears were up and he was facing the old house with the same laser focus he showed earlier. The night was clear enough and the moon shone dim light over the whole clearing. The old house was maybe 15 yards up the hill and the cemetery was just adjacent to our campsite, no more than 10 yards away. As soon as I sat up and looked around, I heard what sounded like a child or a woman crying coming from the direction of the old house. I jumped up and took a few steps out of the woods onto the property to get a better perspective. I saw nothing, but at this point, the sound of crying was unmistakable. It gave me a creepy shiver, but I was an absolute non-believer in anything paranormal. Hello, I called. No response. The crying tapered to a low whimper and I heard the quiet murmur of a male voice. I was convinced that some people had wandered up and might need some help. I looked toward the camp to see Sean still frozen in place. Of course, there was a reasonable explanation for these voices. 
It was just people, right? As I began walking up the hill toward the old house, I admit that I was starting to feel uneasy. Something just seemed off or unnatural. I began to regret not bringing my flashlight. I thought about going back for it, but I decided to head up the hill and clear this up. The moonlight was bright enough that I would be able to see anyone who was there. Of the old house, there only remained the chimney, a rough slab floor, and a few rotten timbers strewn around. Nowhere to hide, no one there. I could clearly hear the voices. The people should be right here, but nobody was. My skin crawled. I have never been creeped out like that before. I circled the perimeter and still saw nothing. If there had been anyone there, I would have seen them. The shock I felt at that moment is indescribable. I was forced to accept that something unexplainable had happened that shook my entire belief system. Sean tried to warn me. At this point, the crying and murmuring just stopped, followed by dead silence. I don't know how long I stood there unable to move. I had absolutely heard those voices, and there was nowhere to hide, and nowhere to go without being seen and heard. I had no idea how to process what I had experienced. The old man told me the place was haunted. Was it? What else could it be? I walked back down the hill to the campsite. Sean was so happy to see me. He wagged his tail furiously and danced in place until I came up and petted him. We sat in the campsite wide awake for what seemed like an eternity, waiting for dawn so we could see to walk out of here. I was terrified that something else would happen, but the rest of the night passed without incident. Sean and I left that place as soon as there was enough light to navigate the deep forest. When we made it back to town, I contacted the gentleman who had told me the story. We met a couple of days later, and I related my story. He showed no surprise and assured me that what I had experienced was indeed the ghosts of the family who had lived there. In the light of day, my rational mind wants to deny what I experienced, but I know it happened. If I ever wanted to go back to that old ruin, I think it is the one place in this world Sean would refuse to follow. He need not worry, I'm never going near that place again. Uncle Johnny From Leah Bia In my early childhood, I lived with my grandparents in the ancestral home passed down the family tree. The house is nothing special. Just plain white paneling, sort of dingy, no shutters decorating the windows, and a roof that has been patched many times. Even with all the blemishes and wear of time, my grandparents took pride in the history inside the walls. It was a fantastic place for me to explore, and I have a lot of memories exploring through all the odd placement spaces throughout the home. As a child, my bedroom was set up in what the family calls the sewing room. It's where my great-great-grandmother used to sew clothes for the family. I once saw a picture of her in a photo album somewhere. The spacious room was more than enough space and was always the coldest in the house. In the hallway leading to the bedrooms, textured paneling is placed below the wallpaper. When you run your hand through it, it makes a ripple sound. It was a habit for all of us to walk along the hall with our hands pressed against the paneling making a satisfying reverberation. The event that has always stood out in my memory, and the reason I'm telling this story to you, happened when I was about seven or so. I was up way past bedtime this night. I was playing on my bed quietly to myself. The house was dead silent except for the distant snoring of my grandparents in their bedroom. I had dropped one of my toys on the floor and went to bend down to get it when I heard the familiar ripple-like sound from the hallway. Then these tiny dancing footsteps led to just outside the bedroom door. I'm not sure why this was my reaction, but I quickly pulled the covers over me, pretending to be asleep. The ripple sound stopped. I didn't hear another sound. I quickly began to get sleepy under the covers and drifted off. My sleep was interrupted a short time later when I heard a small giggle then a whisper outside my door. I jolted up from the covers. 
guessing that I dreamed it, I stumbled my way to the door. No one was there. The hallway was dead silent, and the only light came from the moonlight through the window down the hall. My grandparents' bedroom door was closed. I turned to go back to bed when I heard from behind me, I'm scared. With a small shriek, I ran down the hallway into my grandparents' room and slept on the floor. In the morning, they woke up confused as to why I was sleeping there on the floor like that. So I told my grandma what happened. She told me that the house is haunted. So many generations have lived their whole lives here. It is to be expected. I explained the child's voice to her. With recognition on her face, she said not to be afraid. She knew who it was. The child's voice likely came from her baby brother, who had been very ill since he was born. He had passed away at just five years old. She had never mentioned her brother before. I guess it must have been a sad memory for her. She showed me a few faded and old pictures of him. She took in a breath as if wondering whether to share her thoughts or not. Then she told me that as a toddler, I always did have a fascination with playing with an imaginary friend in the very same hallway. I had to come to terms with the fact that I lived in a haunted house until I started middle school. Nothing that strange happened again, though. Eventually, I moved out with my aunt into a better school district. When I visited my grandparents, I made my bed on the living room sofa with the TV on. The sewing room is not my room anymore. I will not go into the upstairs hallway at night ever again. The only thing I have to take from that night is that I met my great uncle Johnny long after he passed and he told me that he was scared. Thank you for tuning in to Unexplained Encounters. If you're not already, follow and listen to Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating while you're at it. Get some cool creepy merch at eeriecast.store. Check out my other show where I narrate scary work stories. It's called Tales from the Break Room. For more terrifyingly entertaining shows from EerieCast, go to eeriecast.com. And if you want to listen to Unexplained Encounters and all the other EerieCast shows without pesky ads, sign up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com slash plus. You'll also get exclusive access to horror audiobooks only available to EerieCast Plus members. And you'll get 20% off our EerieCast.store merch through our members-only monthly discount code. Finally, if you have a scary story of the unexplained, send it to me at darkstories.org. I think that's about it. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world... It's a strange one.